Ad name Craig. Craig. Grateful to be in a Narcotics Anonymous meeting clean. I'm truly grateful. And uh, thanks for sharing, Shirley. I really appreciate it. I could definitely identify with a whole, of what, a whole lot of what you shared. Um, and my topic is uh, empathy isn't a treatment plan. It's a way of life. And I just want to thank a convention committee for spending a lot of time trying to come up with some off-the-wall topics, uh, <laughs> keeping it interesting. Right. Uh, be, it's a whole lot easier just to be able to come up and share your story and just talk about you without having to try to tie it into something. But I guess when you're sticking with the theme, uh, that's the work they put into it, so I'm grateful. Creativity. It's a creative spirit. That's what it talks about in our literature. Uh, so I just want to start off that... Um, and, I'm, and I also appreciate the committee for asking me to come and share. Um, and empathy, you know, I'm just going to start with, because <clears throat> I really can't do a, a good job of carrying the message, because all I ha without talking about me, that's really all I got to offer. An honest message uh, rings true. You know, my greatest asset is what I bring to the table, and that's me. Uh, I spent my whole life, I, I really tried to be, y'all or anybody else I could be. I wanted to be everybody but me. Uh, I really wanted to be a superhero. I wanted to have some powers and uh, I, I wanted to be an X-Man, you know. I, I wanted to be invincible and um, and I don't know if that played into part of not wanting to feel feelings or not. Really really wasn't sure, don't really care. Uh, it talks about it, um, that why we are addicts is of no immediate importance. The fact is I am one and so what am I gonna do? Uh, and through the step process, I can start identifying some of those whys or, you know, what took places and so forth along the way. But um, I got clean. My clean date is February 17th of 2004. And uh, when I got clean, I first tried to get clean in 90, 96. No, the end of, maybe it was in the 95. I don't even remember. Somewhere in there. And, but, when I, but when I tried to get clean... I thought I had a problem with just one particular drug or any derivative of that drug. I thought as long as I didn't do those, I was going to be okay. And uh, I, went to, I went to a treatment facility and I made a, made a handful of meetings, like really was like, oh, this is pretty cool, you know, I was, I was digging it. Uh, but then um, not too long after that, um, I moved back to Tennessee because I, I, stayed, I stayed at a halfway house. Uh, in Huntsville after treatment because I thought, shit, everybody I know in Murfreesboro uses. Or no, really what I thought was everybody in Murfreesboro uses. I come to find out it was just everybody I knew used. Uh, so I stayed, in, I stayed in Alabama for a while, and, and then I moved back. And when I got back, it wasn't but a few days later that, that somebody said, uh, man, I'm real proud of you for getting off all that hard stuff. You know, I got, I got something for you. And, of course, he had a joint. Um, and I, my, my aunt had asked me if I was going to stop smoking marijuana. And I was like, well, uh, I mean, if I have to, I will. But I wasn't selling my shit and your shit because of marijuana. Like, I, I thought it was just this problem. I didn't realize, really didn't get into the idea of the, of the disease of addiction. And, and you know, some of those uh, slick slogans and, and sayings like, uh, you know, when you come up to a train track and you hear the bells ringing and the lights are flashing and the horn blowing and the bar dropping down, none of that is to tell you the caboose is going to run your ass over. It's telling you the first one's going to get you. And, and so I didn't really understand that. But So I started using again and I got and I got dragged by the disease of addiction for eight more years. And I remember in that first time in, in like 96 or whenever it was that um, – I remember in a handful of meetings that I went to, people were talking about sponsors and literature and so forth and, and uh, making meetings. And So when I got clean this time, uh, I thought, shit, I'm going to give me one of them sponsor things. I really don't, I really don't know what they're going to do or what it really is, but they were talking about it then, and, now, and they're still talking about it. So I thought, well, I guess I'm going to try it and, and give it a whirl, but... Um, and I kind of need to say just um, for the sake of feelings, because that's kind of what empathy is. Empathy is uh, the identifying with someone, uh, someone else vicariously through feelings, emotions, or behaviors. And, and um, so for the sake of my feelings, uh, my grandfather, who was my father figure, just passed away a little over six months ago. And um, he drank like a case to two cases a day. 
And in on Christmas Day of 2003, he had a major basal stroke and went to the hospital. Now, I couldn't stop using. 2003 was the that was the end of the road. I'd had all I could stand. I couldn't stand no more, but didn't know a way out, so I still kept dabbling up until February of 04. But but 03, it was it. The ride was almost over. I just didn't know how to get off of it. Uh, and when he had that stroke, he went into the hospital on Christmas Day, and I stayed with him, afraid I was going to lose him. I stayed with him for a whole week, seven days. I did not use for seven days. Now, y'all heard me say my clean dates in February, so I didn't stop using because the minute they said, hey, he's going home, I called my uncle and said, you got to come get him. I got to go because I had to go and use. But I was really scared of losing him. And from that point on, he stopped drinking and until he passed away. And uh, um, there was a whole lot of seeing him after all those years and, and the thought of losing him. And, you know, like 03, was, it was – it was a hell of a ride, and you know, and I thank God for all that. Because if it wasn't for all that, I wouldn't have all this. Uh, but in that process, something said, "Man, you need to stop. You know, this ain't the way to live anymore." And and um, and I remember I was curled up in a fetal position in my truck, and still don't know how I kept the damn truck through act addiction. But anyhow, uh, I was curled up in a fetal position, and see, I didn't believe. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't have that experience, and so I. I thought there may be some kind of God, but no kind of God's going to fuck with me because of the stuff that I did. Uh, using and trying to find a ways and means to get more. Through working some steps, I realized that the reason I didn't think any kind of God was going to have anything to do with me because of all the stuff I had done sexual, sexually, that was the stuff that was the big barrier because we found out, some of us found out that we were addicts long before we started using drugs. My first drug of choice was more now fantasy and sex. Uh, anything that felt good. Uh, and don't tell. That was what I was strung out on. That's what, uh, you know, when you shared about the getting molested, I was uh, molested at about five, and that's what the guy that molested told me two things. He said, don't that feel good and don't tell. So I spent the rest of my life chasing whatever felt good and not telling. And um, and so, so now I'm in a position, in a fetal position. My great-grandmother had just passed away a few years prior, and, sh and she was real into, you know, into religion and, and God, and, you know, I I wasn't, but she was. And I believe that, it, you know, if there was one, she was kicking it with him. And uh, But I still didn't think he would have anything to do with me. So what I said was, Grandma, Mom, I'm, I know you're up there. So I didn't realize I had faith, but I said, Grandma, Mom, I know you're up there. So if you will, please put in a good word for me. I need some help. Now, I didn't stop then. That wasn't February 16th or nothing. But but uh, a couple of weeks later, I found my way into a Narcotics Anonymous meeting. And I started listening. I, I was, you know, uh, I, do, I was doing an intensive outpatient program, too. And and uh, they, that's what happened the first day there. Somebody said, hey, you want to go to the NA meeting? I'm like, hell yeah, because I tried it, you know, eight or, eight or nine years prior. So I was excited to get the opportunity to go to one. And... Uh, when I got to the meetings, immediately, like there's a magic that happens in our meetings. And that's, that word is one of the words used in our literature, in the basic text, magic. Having, and if you didn't, if, and for me, that was the best word to describe it because I didn't understand spirituality or empathy or any of that. But magic, okay, that makes some sense because I thought somebody was doing some waving of the hands. I didn't know what was going on, but, <laughs> but I know now, when I walked into that meeting, there was a connection. I knew I was in the right place. Now, I'm going to say, because in, in part of identification, you know, empathy being the topic, I want to say that when, when I got clean in, from where I'm from, I was the only white person at the meeting. And I knew I was at home. I was in the right spot. It didn't matter. I'm like, whew, man, finally made it. <laughs> you know, um, and, but I remember still with, with the, you know, the disease, you know, some of another slick, slick saying is, you know, if you're looking to identify, you're looking for a way in. If you're trying to separate, you're looking for a way out. And so I was, but my disease always, because while I wanted to be a superhero as a kid, man, I never was okay in my own skin. I could never be me, but I could be whoever I needed to be based on who I was around, whatever group I was in. I fit in with all of them. My senior year, I was like, I was the student body president because all the cliques 
voted for me because I, I was in with all of them. I could be in all of them. And, and so, so not, not being okay with me, never thinking I was good enough, never thinking I belong, never thinking, you know, spending my whole life thinking on one hearing on one shoulder, you're not good enough, what you have to say ain't going to matter, they're not going to like you or love you, and on the other shoulder at the exact same time, fuck it, you're better than they are anyhow. And so never fitting in, never belonging, uh, to walk into that meeting and to hear these people sharing, and they're talking about they got four years clean, I went, she just got out of jail. Ain't no way, no way you really got four years clean. You know, uh, and if you, and then, you know, them talking about using on the streets, I like, Psh, if you used on the streets, you used on Sesame Streets, because the streets I used on, you can't get four years. That's not going to happen. And I really didn't think I was going to stay clean. I just thought, well, maybe I'll get longer periods of clean time between uses, you know, uh, so that way, you know, eat a couple meals, sleep a couple nights, and maybe get two the next time instead of just half of one, because that's all I could afford. So constantly looking for a way out and trying to not identify with but to to separate from and, and I didn't want to be separate from uh, now I also gonna say it was just a couple of weeks in that ballpark maybe I mean maybe the first week or so of January of 04 and I, when I started making meetings and I would make a few and then use um, I would where I lived with my grandparents was 25 minutes from the meeting and in 25 minutes on the way to the meeting, I knew I was going to the meeting, but damn, I'm going to go to Dope Man's house first. Uh, and sometimes I would really, really, really want to go to the meeting. So my decision in 25 minutes of me being the only one thinking was, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the meeting, and then I'm going to go to the Dope Man's house. And I'd get to his house, and I'd share with him all the good shit at the meeting. I'd try to get him to surrender, you know, like, let me just have some surrender. <laughs> but it didn't really work real well, and... and uh, but eventually, I started listening in the meetings. And, and what I did is, is I find, and I didn't want to tell y'all in the meeting. I didn't want to tell y'all that I was leaving the meeting, going to go to the dope man's house for a couple of reasons. One, I thought I had so much power that I may ruin your life. And I didn't have enough money to share. So, I, you know, I couldn't take you with me. So... I kept that stuff to myself, but when I finally took the risk and got vulnerable and shared with somebody that I, well, actually, I don't even think I shared it at first. What happened is I got the, I got the book. They told me to buy the book and read the book till the book reads me. I didn't have a life. I had nothing. Me and two kids moved into my grandparents' house. I had nothing but time. I was unemployable, derelict. I was, man, I was a hot mess. And, and so I didn't do nothing. I didn't do anything but read the literature. And when I ran across it, when it talks about uh, for an addict to think of using is, is normal, for us staying clean is the abnormal, I went, well, damn. <laughs> so I took a risk and I shared it with somebody. And from that point on, um, I don't think I've used since then. No, I did use one last time, February 16th. But I, so I started staying clean because I got honest with what I was thinking. And, and I got a sponsor and I started connecting with this guy and I stayed in this literature. And, and this literature was me, you know. Uh, they told me that a person with a basic text that's falling apart usually ain't. And so I'm, you know, I'm grateful the binder of mine's finally come apart. I was like, yeah, is it ever going to break? But because I believe in this program and, and it wasn't, if it wasn't for the people that were here when I got here to help me, I learned to identify, to call me on my shit, to connect with me, to let me know that there was a way out and that I could do this too. And it was, uh, it says, it says, uh, Sharing with fellow addicts is a basic tool in our program. This help can only come from another addict. It is the help that says, I have had something like that happen to me, and I did this. And for anyone who wants our way of life, we share experience, strength, and hope instead of preaching and judging. If sharing the experience of our pain helps just one person, it was worth the suffering. We strengthen our own recovery when we share with others who ask for help. And, uh, and that's what started happening is, is I started, you know, I'm driving down the road because I shared about how, you know, I th all these things sexual. I know today they were sexual, but then I just thought it was the using that would keep any kind of God from messing with me. And, and through the step process, that's changed. But I was riding with my sponsor and he was, he's a, he was a semi driver, big old dude, six foot four fella. And we're riding down the highway. And, and, uh, cause I told you I didn't have a life. I wasn't working. So I'm gonna go with him to his job. And, and while we're riding, you know, he's talking. This joker lived in the literature, man. And, and that's one of the things, you know, he'd be in the meeting and he'd have his literature out and he'd be reading it while the readings and stuff were going on. And I didn't know what he was doing. But, but man, the next thing you know, he'd share so passionately. 
And I was like, man, that's fire. That guy right there is, he's serious about this stuff. You know, I didn't know anything. But uh, we were, were driving down the highway, and, he's, and he, if he said it once, I think he said it ten times, we're as sick as our secrets. And I think he was prodding, and trying to get a joker to tell a secret. But I thank God that he did. Because I sat there for a minute, and I was like, oh, God, I don't know what. Man, don't tell it. Shh, just don't tell it. And and I, when I was at that little uh, uh, halfway house back in '96, uh, they did a little house meeting or something that little, little gathering they was doing, and uh, they said to write down the thing you're the most ashamed of. And so I wrote it down, right? But I didn't do anything else with it. Now it's really on the surface. I'm like, oh God, it ain't going nowhere. And all the dope in the world wouldn't make that disappear. But he said, he kept saying, we're sick as our secrets, we're sick as our secrets, we're sick as our secrets. And then finally I just said, all right, whatever, fuck it, I'm taking the risk. I didn't know if he was going to beat me up, throw me out the semi, throw me out the program. I didn't know what was about to happen, but we were sick as our secrets, and I'm tired of being sick. Tired. And so I put it out there. I said, man, when I was a kid, I acted out sexually with my cousin. This joker, I braced for because I didn't know what was coming. <laughs> and he tried to outdo me. <laughs> and I went, man, I am not alone. And he's talking about this relationship with a higher power and all this stuff. And, I, and at that point, I started thinking. I got the greatest sense of hope. I thought, man, maybe, just maybe. Now, at this point, I'm... I, I dive in, I'm in the literature, I'm, I'm, you know, at every meeting and all over the countryside, I'm living narcotics and how my life is changing, I'm freaking excited. I had 20, 22 days clean, now I hadn't used, you know, I shared with my sponsor, I used, and, and then, and then a week later, that, that semi event took place, and a week later, I used, but I didn't tell it, and, and so a week later, he's telling, uh, I didn't, when I told him the first time what my clean date was, he wrote it down in his calendar. <laughs> and so I used a week later, and, and, and from then on, for the next three weeks, I was trying to figure out how to tell this joker I had used, uh, that my clean date changed without telling him I had used, right? <laughs> and so I was doing a lot of coming up with some schemes, and, and eventually uh, on and it's a good one, but I, on, on February 16th of 2004, I had 23 days clean. My sponsor thought I had 29. No, I had 22. He thought I had 29. The next day, I was going to pick up a 30-day key tag. He only had 23 days. I had to pick up the key, you know, the key tag. And he's, um, but I ended up using that night. And I justified it. It was after midnight, so it was really 23 days. So I can still hold on to the lie of 30 days, even though I just used. And I, after using, I was curled up in a fetal position on the couch when the dope was gone. And the guy had the guy said, I just told you I had 23 days, 22 days clean. And the guy said, man, I still got some money. Can you get us some more dope? I didn't go over there to use. I went over there to get laid. But when I got there, there was dope there, and I was rendered powerless. And I had, I mean, I used uh, everything. <laughs> and, and in the process, afterwards, I was curled up in a fetal position. After he, asked me to, after he asked me to go get some more dope, I said, man, I, I give away all my, I, I erased all my contacts. I don't know that guy's number. I have nine years, 11 months, and one day, that dude's number was 5892424. I still know that number. Right? That dope, I still knew the dope man's number. 22 days clean talking about I don't know <laughs> Shit. so he said uh, so but I remember after I after I told him that lie because I didn't want to use I didn't go there to use I curled up on a fetal position and I said God please 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 don't let me go nowhere I was afraid that if I left to go cop I'd never been in prison or jail or anything for drugs for other things but not for drugs and I just I said man please don't let me leave because I knew if I would get leave I would get arrested and might not ever make it back to Narcotics Anonymous and I looked and I stayed since then no you no reason a lot of stuff's happened no excuse to use went the next night picked up that 30-day key tag just like I was planning on doing 
So, if y'all in here lying about your clean time, keep coming back. You ain't the first person to do it. And a few, a couple of weeks later, there was a kid sitting beside me. I still remember his name, his old fuzzy hair and everything. He said, he's into me, 15 years old. He was sitting beside me in the meeting. They were passing out key tags. He said, I got to give my key tag back because I used in treatment. I went, God, kid, shut up, man. Nobody's going to know. They don't have to know it's yours. <laughs> Shit, I'm keeping mine. I don't know what he's doing. So I, and I held on to mine for a few more days, but it's all... But it's hard to be dishonest in an honest program, but I was trying like hell. Eventually, I got honest. <laughs> but if there wasn't for people sharing, in that, I, you know, in that 25-minute trip to town, and I kept going to the dope man's house, or would make it to the meeting and go to the dope man's house after, I finally shared that with somebody, and my sponsor gave me a recovery tape. The guy's name was Lenny, uh, and I had the tape. I was hoping, I forgot, I thought we had a, a tape player in the truck. And uh, I was looking forward to listening to it on the way here, on the way traveling down. Uh, but that guy really played a part in saving my life. Man, he's used in and out for years since then. Um, but he saved my life because in that 25-minute ride, I learned how to listen instead of think. And he was sharing all the stuff he was sharing and the stories he was going through, the stuff he said. He said that uh, he was, he told me that, or he told me, like, right, I'm so self-centered. He was only talking to me. But he, he was sharing. He was sharing that about his experience with his with his uh mother dying and that when he went to uh, and that he said uh he had put his sponsor's phone number on the wall beside the phone and when his mother died he grabbed all his stuff money at eighteen hundred dollars getting it grabbed his keys and was heading out to you as soon as he opened his door his sponsor was standing there and said i got the same phone call you ain't going nowhere and I said, oh, shit. I went right home. I wrote that number. My sponsor's number My sponsor's number is still. My first sponsor's number is still on the wall beside the, beside the phone. And uh, he visits my grandmother regularly. And, uh, but at the same, you know, those little things that I didn't realize were going to happen, those were the things of people sharing. This is what it was like. This is what happened to me. This is how I got through this stuff. You know, uh, and to, to be able to identify, there's a, there's a section in We Do Recover. Uh, in the italicized portion which Jimmy had written and uh, and it talks about we feel language we feel the time uh, because they were unable to identify with the alcoholic in AA their identification was at the level of apparent symptoms and not at the deeper level of emotions or feelings where empathy becomes a healing therapy for all addicted people mm -hmm. then it goes down the next paragraph and it says that this was what was principally needed has proved itself in these passing years. That wordless language of recognition, belief, and faith, which we call empathy, created the atmosphere in which we could feel time, touch reality, and recognize spiritual values long lost to many of us. And in the process of coming in and, and, and learning to live this way of life, this is what I learned how to, I learned how to connect through the literature. Uh, and if you're in here hating on somebody who talks about the literature, please keep coming back. You know, if you want to call me a book thumper, <laughs> my life is what it is today because of this and because y'all told me to get one of these. And y'all share with me your experiences, whatever they may be. And I learned how to listen. I learned this, this literature has guided me and showed me how to live this program how I'm supposed to try to practice these principles and stuff, but if it wasn't for y'all sharing your experiences, I'd be lost. You know, I could go and get a, I could get a, a, a manual on how to uh, rebuild a diesel engine. Never touched a diesel engine, but I could get a manual and read it. But if I don't have somebody showing me how to do some of that stuff, it ain't going to make a lick of sense. And that's where y'all came in, and the empathy and identification and learning that we're all the same. Trying to practice some of these principles and in all my affairs and, and to know it doesn't matter where I'm at that I can identify in one form or another and sometimes I've learned that um, you know like you were sharing about the about the uh, not wanting to be sharing away from crowds and and not wanting to be in the center of attention I totally identified but at the opposite end of the spectrum so it would be easy for me to go well I don't identify but shit I did identify with the spotlight and I, I want to be in it and that's okay, but that, that was still a level of identification and empathy and, and understanding. 
that can, that has never came from anywhere else in my life but right here. You know, and, and I'm so grateful to other people. And I got to say this, too, because there's one other thing that's really important with this identification and, and me staying. I got into the literature, started working steps, started studying our traditions and trying to live this way of, my, of life. All I could do is mimic it. And if you're just mimicking, please keep mimicking it. One day you'll understand what you're doing and you and it'll be part of who you are. But in the in the beginning, all I could do was judge the shit out of y'all, tell y'all what y'all was doing wrong, that y'all didn't have a program, y'all weren't working it like I was working it, so you don't even have a program. You want me to sponsor you, okay, uh, with 18 months clean. And I, I would come into the meetings, and I was so self-righteous because I believed. And it talks about in the sixth step about that self-righteousness and how many – and talks about normal people – uh, make wonderful decisions in life based on being confident in their own beliefs. But our defects are normal human characteristics blown out of proportion. So my, I was so confident in this that my whole life revolves around it and that I was telling y'all, since y'all weren't as confident as I was, let me give you some confidence and, uh, and that you can do it too. Just follow me. And so I was telling the people in the rooms who had more time than me, those guys that had four years when I got there, that had, had shown up every business meeting for years till my old funky ass showed up. I was When I was going into the meetings telling them they didn't have a program, thank God they had enough of one to put up with my ass. Thank God they still loved on me and gave me to keep coming back. Even if they might not have meant it, they still said it. You know what I'm saying? But I'm grateful that there were people that stuck around and that have showed me how to live and have welcomed me and with open arms and guided me in this way of life. If you're new, if you're in here and you're new, welcome home. If you don't understand anything that you hear, at, you heard at this workshop, there's another one right after it. If you haven't got a sponsor, take a risk. Yeah. Take a risk. Uh, God, I know how to run my life straight into the ground. You know, that Midas touch, everything you touch turns to gold. Well, I don't have that. I got the attic touch. Everything I touch turns to shit. You know, and if you want to get you, you want to lose everything, call me. I can give you some guidance. But through the process and following directions of others and living these steps and these traditions, because I don't, because it, it also goes on into talking in the, in the fifth tradition, talking about our primary purpose, how, how uh, the empathy is vital to that. And, uh, and, and I strongly believe that if it wasn't for our traditions, there would be no place for us to talk about our step experience. So which one came first, chicken or the egg? Doesn't matter. You can't have one without the other. Which one's more important, steps or traditions? To me, they're the same. And uh, learning these principles and trying to live in my, in my life has changed my life. And uh, I'm so glad you guys are here. This meeting would have sucked if I'd have been the only one in it. Thanks for letting me share. <laughs>